hold my hamstring just before the stock. So, uh, <laughs> 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 I'll just uh, I'll assume everybody's kind of on board with the idea that understanding is interesting, important, and possibly one of the aims of science, if not the main aim of science. Uh, and so it's an interesting question to ask whether AI can understand or increase scientific understanding. Um, some people have said that it does, uh, especially with respect to chat GPT. Some people say it understands because it passes comprehension tests. So those things test for comprehension. Comprehension is a synonym for understanding. So it understands. Uh, you could also say that it passes sentiment. It does sentiment analysis. And that's kind of a, an even more sophisticated thing that contributes to understanding. But really understand the meaning and the, the tone behind somebody's words. People say that it understands language or languages, that it understands economics or genetics or law, typically because it can pass certain tests that we usually deploy uh, for typically students uh, or professional organizations or societies to see if people understand stuff. Uh, okay, well, what does it mean to understand? Very quickly, um, we have a bunch of different views. Wittgenstein says it's the skill to use knowledge. Uh, Friedman says it's understanding. Understanding is having unified beliefs. Darwin says it's grasping an explanation which lays out the causal history of a phenomenon and strips away anything that's not a difference maker. Grimm says it's uh, knowledge of causes or grasp, uh, grasping explanations that tell us dependency relations between variables. A more general way to, to understand understanding. Grimm Khalifa says it's grasping the explanatory nexus. Uh, for some phenomenon in a way that resembles scientific knowledge. Hank <clears throat> says that a phenomenon is understood by a subject when that subject possesses an explanation of a phenomenon where that explanation is based on a theory which is intelligible, and that means that the theory has a cluster of qualities that facilitate its use for a scientist, and where that explanation conforms to the basic epistemic values of empirical adequacy and consistency. Mauricio says understanding is drawing informative inferences from representation. It's a more encompassing view. Uh, Angela says genuine understanding requires mastery of the target. Kate Elgin, who's in, I guess some ways a matriarch of the modern discussion on understanding, says understanding involves the capacity to operate successfully within the constraints that the system dictates or challenge those constraints effectively. And it involves an ability to profit from cognitive labors to draw out the implications of findings, to integrate them into the theory, to utilize them in practice. Understanding is not a matter of believing, it involves knowing how to wield one's commitments to further one's epistemic ends. It involves being able to draw inferences, raise questions, frame potentially fruitful inquiries, and so on. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff on understanding. It's not clear that everybody's talking about the same thing. Michael Hennon has a nice paper uh, from 2021 where he tries to systematize things a little bit and he <laughs> distinguishes between three kinds of understanding, drawing on previous work that, that also does similar sorts of stuff. And so one kind of understanding is explanatory and you have this kind of understanding when you grasp or know or possess an explanation for why something is the case. So uh, I come home and my native house is burned to the ground and I want to know why. Uh, firefighter says somebody fell asleep with a candle uh, that was lit. Their house burned down. Fire spread to your house. That's why your house is ashes. Now I understand why my house is ashes. Lots of people think that this is the most important kind of understanding. And I think part of the motivation for that view is we think that's the final outcome. Of, that's the, it's the most important thing that science gives us. These explanations, we value those explanations. Uh, uh, quite a bit, and so we should focus on this kind of function. Objection one understanding is a bit different. The idea here is that you understand something um, like, a, like a city or a person or a subject matter or a, a system, experimental system, by grasping the dependency relations that unite or connect um, systems of information, elements in systems of information. So I understand Paris, if I can say how to get from point A to point B, if I can give some recommendations for coffee shops or restaurants or avoid certain areas for certain reasons and things like that. Um, that's the idea there. And there's a lot of people who think this is really the kind of understanding that we should be focusing on um, because some of the dependency relations 
some of them will be causal, some of them will be mathematical, but some of them will be explanatory. Some of them might be semantic, but some of them will be explanatory. And so if you have this, you probably have explanatory understanding as well. Lastly, you have a kind of understanding that people don't talk about quite as much. And um, Karim calls this practical understanding. It's understanding how to do something um, via having certain skills or abilities. There's a few people who think this is a really interesting kind of understanding. I think it's a really interesting kind of understanding. Uh, and some people think this is the one we should be talking about. I also think this is the one we should be talking about. Okay, so you've got different kinds of understanding, uh, and we can talk about AI in this context. But I think we need at least another set of variables, and that's the different roles AI can play with respect to increasing scientific understanding. So it could be a mere tool. We talked about this yesterday. Uh, and today as well. So it could be a, a what do we call it? A, a imagination prosthetic or a cognitive computational prosthetic or conceptual microscope, all nice metaphors. Or we could think of it as a collaborator, or we could think about it as uh, an understander, an agent that has its own kind of understanding, which it would then communicate with us, uh, hopefully. Okay, so now we have this set of possibilities. Um, I might think I want to talk about this one, and I'll uh, explain why. But you could talk about any of them. Uh, I think by talking about this one, we are going to be able to talk about all of them. Okay, so why would anybody think this? Why would anybody think that that's possible? The AI itself could have some practical understanding. Um, there are people who have talked about this and is careful about it, and it's worth, worth thinking about. So. Mario in a recent paper says AI can discover new understanding. Um, I like that. It's careful. Uh, the algorithm that they've developed most recently is said to be the source of scientific understanding. Uh, in an even more recent paper, he and his collaborators say that there are no examples of AI agents that have understanding. But if they did, here's how you would know. Uh, an AI has understanding if it can recognize qualitatively characteristic consequences of the theory, so performing exact computations, use them in a new context, and transfer their understanding to a human expert. This is just Hank Direct's view. They really like Hank's view. I also like Hank's view. They're trying to make a behavioral operationalization, I guess, of some kind of understanding. And this sounds quite a bit like practical understanding. It's about what the thing can do. If it can do certain things, then it has understanding. Um, another person who draws on Hank is Hank himself in an even more recent paper where they argue that you can have tests of understanding that apply both to humans and to machine learning models. They say understanding is an ability, so this sounds like practical understanding to me, to do a bunch of stuff, provide explanations, derive qualitative results, answer questions, solve problems, extend knowledge, and so on. Okay, so uh, there's already people who are talking about what I think is AI agents themselves, you want to call them agents, having something like a practical understanding. Here's why I think that's a really interesting thing to talk about, uh, not just because people who I respect are talking about it, but also because I think practical understanding is a necessary condition for the other kinds of understanding. I think you can't have the other ones unless you have this. Um, both of the other kinds of understanding uh, rely on grasp. Grasp is crucial to both. Uh, explanatory and objectual understanding. You have to grasp an explanation. If I write down an explanation, you put it in your backpack, in some sense you possess the, the explanation, but you don't understand. You have to grasp the explanation. What does it mean to grasp an explanation? I think the most traditional, the most hard-nosed philosopher in the literature is Green Khalifa, and he says, this is basically ability. You need certain abilities. They're not special abilities, but you need those abilities. Probably conceptual abilities. Um, same thing with Grimm. Uh, same thing with others. Strevens, I think, uh, explicitly characterizes grasp as uh, an ability to categorize. Uh, same thing for objectual understanding. It's not just that there have to be the connections and somehow you're exposed to the connections or something like that between elements of the system and connection. You have to grasp those connections. And grasp, again, is either something you can you can test to see whether you have it by looking, looking at your abilities, or it just is an ability. Um, I'll put up with so as he says, so she says, so as he beyond, she says, understanding in general is a cognitive success that manifests itself through abilities, including abilities to do all these epistemic things. Um, right. So if practical understanding 
It's okay. necessary, sufficient, but necessary for the other two kinds of understanding. And those are the only kinds of understanding that there are, let's say. Then if an AI can't have this, then it can't have any understanding. And that's interesting. Uh, maybe I'm preaching to the choir, um, but let's do it anyways. So could AI have practical understanding? Um, you might think about ChatGPT or AlphaGo or AlphaFold or other spectacular successes that we've heard about already. Now, I want to say, while those things have, in some sense, uh, we can talk about this later, whether they have, they actually have an ability or not, but let's just, let's just go with that for now. Even if they have these abilities to do these things, practical understanding can't just be that. Because toasters have abilities, and we don't want to say that they have understanding. Um, particle accelerators have abilities in the same sense, I guess, that AI has, but we don't want to say that those things understand. So you might go, okay, yeah, fine. Those are just like you know, physical things. You're heating or you're directing fields. Um, what about epistemic ability? That sounds like it's more like what we want. We want the ability to explain, to model, to represent, to infer, all that kind of stuff. Well, calculators have epistemic abilities in just the same way. And I don't think anybody wants to say that a calculator understands anything. So there's something I think that's missing. I don't think we should talk only about ability. What's missing? Well, let's take a step far back. I think we would all agree that if understanding is something that we want, uh, it's an epistemic value. Having it is a good thing. Increasing it is a good thing. Having more of it is better than having less of it. And I think if you do something that increases your understanding, then you should be praised for it. There's some epistemic reasons to say you did a good thing. Um, I think when we're talking about understanding that agents have, it makes a lot of sense to talk about understanding as a virtue. It's something that is a good making feature of you that you, can, that you have and you can increase. Virtues are typically separated into reliableist and responsibleist. Reliableist virtue is something like good eyesight. So it's a virtue in the sense that it makes your life better. You do better because you have epistemically better because you have good eyesight. You can see things that are further away with uh, more accuracy, something like that. You can't be praised for it. Responsibleist virtues, these are virtues that you uh, have because of effort that you put into something and that you came out of that, that effort, that effortful behavior with uh, something new, a new ability, which is a good one, which makes your life better, which makes you better as an epistemic agent. Uh, like learning how to perform experiments or make a computational model, all sorts of other things. And I think if we're talking about praiseworthiness, then an understander must be responsible for their understanding. Understanding must be a responsibleist virtue. I don't think we would want to say that because someone has good eyesight, they understand. That doesn't sound right. It has to be something like you gained your understanding by doing a bunch of stuff, which makes you praiseworthy for the understanding that you have, for the practical understanding that you have. And for that to be possible, you have to be responsible. Um, okay, so let me now say what I think practical understanding is. Um, I'm not actually as confident as this. The whole fun makes me look confident. I'm not this confident, but here we go. Uh, it's fun to pretend you're confident. Plus, so an agent has practical understanding with respect to something. If and only if they have the ability to reliably and successfully manipulate that thing or the parts of that thing to achieve their goals. I think this is fine as it is, but if you uh, are squirmy about it and you want to say um, we should only focus on epistemic abilities, then that's fine. You just say success and goals are epistemic success, epistemic goals. But I'm a little bit of a pragmatist, so I'm okay with being a bit looser. But that's not it. You have to add more. And you have to be responsible for having gained that ability. These two things are satisfied, then you have practical understanding. Okay, so I think this makes sense of a lot of stuff that we look at. Amoebas have pretty simple abilities. I mean, compared to us, compared to other things, they have incredible abilities, but um, compared to us, they have pretty simple abilities. They have extremely little or no responsibility for those abilities. So they have no or very little practical understanding. Dogs? more complex abilities, a little bit of responsibility. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't tell them that they've done wrong. And uh, a little bit of practical understanding of the result. Kids, more complex abilities, more responsibility. They have some serious, uh, non-negligible practical understanding. Adults, they have outright practical understanding. No surprise that we define outright in terms of other humans. This is what interests us mostly up until six months ago when ChatGPT uh, started doing some interesting things. 
Okay, so I should say something about ability and responsibility. So what's an ability? You have an ability when you have an ensemble of related dispositions with respect to something. So uh, I have the ability to play piano. If you put a piano in front of me, I can play it or I'm disposed to play it or think about it in certain sorts of ways. Uh, you, can, you can constrict this to just epistemic ability if you want. And that ability should be present in the majority of most possible worlds. So uh, if I play the piano and I get my I lose my hands in some horrific but agricultural uh, accident. Uh, in the majority of close possible worlds where that didn't happen, I can still play the piano. So I can still, I still have the ability to play the piano in this world, even though I can't actually play the piano. I'm just drawing from uh, existing accounts of abilities. You increase your ability when your ability is more stable with respect to changes in the thing your ability is directed towards and the environment. Uh, when you can perform more successful, relevant actions on the thing. And when those actions are more successful, so both quantitative and qualitative, increase as possible. Now, uh, you can increase your understanding by increasing your ability. There's sort of no ceiling. The more, more ability you have, the more understanding you can say you have. Responsibility is not quite like that. You kind of just need a threshold, and then you're good. Increasing responsibility beyond some threshold doesn't seem to be super relevant. What's responsibility? Here we can look to the, the gigantic literature on responsibility. There's an epistemic condition and a control condition. So you have to be aware of the consequences of your actions and you have to have control over your actions. At least those two things need to be in place. You have greater responsibility when you're more aware of the consequences of your actions. That can get you from recklessness and negligence to purposeful or intentional uh, action, which gets you longer and longer sentences in prison. Uh, and you have more control of your actions. So can AI be responsible for its abilities? Does it meet the epistemic condition? Um, is it aware of the consequences of its actions in some kind of interesting sense? I don't think so. Some brain problem, brain problem doesn't seem right. Pick your favorite metaphor for talking about AI. Uh, you can say AI is just a bunch of addicts is moving super fast. You can build computers with dominoes and they do their thing. Um, if you haven't watched these videos, watch them. They're just super fun. Uh, they build a half adder and full adder using dominoes. Uh, you can build computers using gravity and marbles. You can uh, magic the gatherings during complete. You can make a computer using magic the gathering. You can make a uh, computer out of water and gravity. Um, you could, in principle, uh, I guess, like throwing the Statue of Liberty, but in principle, you could make a neural network. You could make a transformer based uh, machine learning model out of dominoes. Um, we don't want to say that those things know the consequences of their actions. That makes no sense. So let's say it's not epistemically, it uh, doesn't satisfy the epistemic condition. What about the control condition? I think this is probably also obvious. To have control over its actions, well, to have control over your actions, you have to act. By act, we usually need intentional action. Intentional actions are those that spring from purposes, reasons, desires, intentions. These are complex mental states, contents, uh, which AI doesn't literally have. So Martha uh, and Henry have a nice paper about this. Um, Okay, so AI doesn't satisfy either the epistemic or control conditions. So any AI, which is like current AI, cannot be responsible for any of the abilities that we might describe to it. Therefore, AI cannot have practical understanding. Therefore, AI cannot have any understanding of dramatic cause. <laughs> okay, what do we do? What can we say that might be interesting? Well, one thing you might do is try to invent a new notion of understanding that is broad enough to capture things that don't have responsibility. Um, Katarina Moruzzi does this for creativity. She says current notions of creativity can't be applied to AI, but AI is doing something like creativity. So let's make a broader notion of creativity that does apply to AI. I think it's a really cool idea. Um, whatever that sense of understanding is, it would not be anything like the existing ones that we have. And I just don't know. Uh, I, I can't think of one. Um, I, maybe the reason is because the notion of understanding we have is specifically for humans. You think about why do we even have this concept to begin with? It's to label certain sorts of people as having certain kinds of value for us. So, so there's that. There's another rapid fire idea. Maybe AI algorithms could satisfy these two conditions, aggregate them together. This is super optimistic. But the idea would be, you know, imagine an entire autonomous lab. One of the AI algorithms searches the literature. Another one comes up with a hypothesis. Another one is having an experiment. Another one oversees the performance of the experiment. Another one interprets the results, and so on and so on. Maybe if you combine them all together, somehow these these things would emerge. But 
don't think that's going to work. Uh, if you don't have any responsibility there to begin with, then no matter how many of them you have, you're not going to get uh, to the threshold. And anyways, even if you did have some low levels of responsibility, I don't think responsibility aggregates. To see this, just think how many kids would you need to have the same amount of responsibility as an adult? How many dogs? How many bees? How many amoeba? Uh, it doesn't seem like that works. Okay. So here's another idea. Maybe AI algorithms can satisfy these conditions when you combine them with humans. Make a mixed agent team where you have AI agents and human agents. I don't think that's going to work either. Um, so I, I just learned about Kira's paper just now when she mentioned it, and I looked it up and read the abstract, and I, I can just, we can just ignore the slide and read your paper. Uh, <laughs> so it uh, doesn't work. Um, you can't transfer. Uh, responsibility to AI. The team itself might be responsible, but the AI doesn't get responsibility by being part of that team. Um, Dominoes can't be collaborators. So what else can we say? I think we could just say, yeah, okay, AI doesn't have practical understanding and therefore doesn't have any understanding, but it's still doing something epistemically really interesting. We should still talk about what exactly that is. And we want to know how we can characterize this contribution. So this is basically starting a, a, another talk entirely, but we're not going to go all the way down that route. Whatever it is we want to say about it, we have to say that it's not connected to responsibility. Maybe we just stick with ability. We go back to what Hank and Mario were saying. We just say, let's talk about ability, but let's not talk about understanding. <laughs> maybe ability is too much even. Maybe you want to say something about function. Um, but other things have abilities in the same sense, I think, as AI. Um, and so, it seems like you can talk about differences in kinds of ability or levels of ability, but it, again, it seems like we're with the same old stew, as uh, Reagan and Rice would say. Um, there's nothing super, super special about AI if you're thinking about it as a tool. Uh, so, okay, fine, that's, that's fine. We can still give it a non-special account. It's still interesting to do. So let's do that. Let's talk about AI as a tool. Why am I saying AI as a tool now? Well, I was assuming before when I split things up into mere tool and collaborator and agent, that that was an exhaustive taxonomy of the roles that AI can play. Maybe it's not, maybe we should revisit that. But if it's not a collaborator and it's not an agent, then it's then it's a tool, because that's, that's all I can think of. I don't know what other people talk about. So it's still a high tool. So Eamon says, um, they aren't justified like other tools are justified. Uh, not justified in the paper, I think you don't want to. They lead to belief in ways that aren't the same ways as other things lead to belief. Uh, other kinds of tools, especially theoretical tools like computer models, have a specific dynamics, which are supposed to reflect the dynamics of the target system. And we know how the dynamics are being modeled to understand uh, what's going on there. And so the justification or the, the way you come to the belief is different. I think that's right. Um, I think it's an important difference. But I still think there is a general sense in which we can portray AI as tools. And so here I'm going to try to do it. Go all the way back to Bacon, who says science can only go so far with unaided human reason, unaided human hands. We need tools to extend the power of both. What's a tool? What's a tool do for Bacon? It's just something that either adds power or focus. It can kind of point you in certain directions that are better. It can also keep you away from certain directions which are less good. So you've got these tools. He says, either the bare hand or the unaided intellect has as much power. The work is done by tools and systems, and the intellect needs them as much as the hand. As the hand's tools either prompt or guide its motion, so the mind's tools either prompt or warn the intellect. I think this is really nice. Uh, I think thinking about tools for the mind is, is really an uh, interesting thing to do. I don't think we should stop there. We have tools of the voice. These would be tools that aid our communication. The internet is one. Tools of the senses. These are our tools that allow us to, to detect things, even senses that we don't have. Tools of the heart. I'm being maybe a bit cute there, but like these would be tools that help us decide what's best to investigate, for example. Something like that. And then there's some types of each of these. So you have tools of the mind, which would include tools of calculation, tools of imagination, tools of memory, and so on. For every possible mental action, there could be a tool that would either increase its power or focus. And then you just evaluate AI uh, as whatever kind of tool it's being used for in the moment. I don't think it's one kind of tool. It can be different kinds of tools, depending on what kind of action it's, it's being, uh, being used to empower. 
I'll say a bit about AI being a tool of imagination because it gives us a lot, a lot of fun to think about. Um, here's how I would do it. I've done some qualitative work looking at scientists and asking them how, how they justify uses of imagination. When is an imagining good? And it turns out it's mostly the consequences. Imagining is good not when it follows some rules of how to imagine well, because that would be kind of weird and impossible to spell out, but when it has good consequences. And then a tool of imagination would be good when it helps the imagination have good consequences. So tools of imagining is good when it improves our imaginings. What do you mean to improve imaginings? To increase the chances that our imaginings have good consequences, produce things that work out. I think this works for any kind of mental action that you want to use AI to replace. So when is a tool of calculation good? When it improves our calculations. When is a tool of um, mathematical discovery good? When it uh, improves our processes of mathematical discovery and so on. So that brings me to the end. We talked about three different kinds of understanding, three ways to increase understanding. I kind of pretended for uh, rhetorical sake that these were exhaustive. We talked about a practical lone wolf understanding for AI and decided that that wasn't possible. And then because of that, understanding is not possible at all for AI when you're thinking about AI as an agent. AI can't be a collaborator also, therefore, so it has to be a tool, if that taxonomy is exhaustive. My proposal is that the epistemic contribution of AI should be characterized not in terms of understanding, but in terms of the kinds of actions that empower the focuses. Uh, you don't need a special epistemology. If you think about um, tools as uh, in a consequentialist framework, then it's pretty clear how this works. Consequentialists, of course, have states that they want to get. Um, there are states that are better or worse. So in ethics, the states that are better are those that have you know, more pleasure, less pain, whatever. Uh, in science, you could say that the states you want to get to are states where we, uh, we as a whole, science as a whole, or individual scientists have more understanding. So understanding still can be a super important end goal, maybe even the end goal, the epistemic end goal of science. Um, and AI can, can contribute, contribute to it as a tool, and it can be understood in this way. Thanks very much.